Oh my God, he will not let it go. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can tell he's Latin. Because Latin people are tenacious as f My name is Nick Barilli, and I'm traveling the country to sit down with some of the biggest Latinx artists in places that are meaning to them and help tell their stories. We'll talk about their journeys and careers and explore issues of identity, culture, discrimination, and representation. This is Seen. Good morning. Welcome to my uh, hotel room. I am in New York City. Uh, flew across the country from LA. We are on our way to meet John Leguizamo. Not only is he having a huge impact on multiple platforms, but he also touched my life in, in a personal way when I got to see his, uh, his one-man show as a teenager and, and really felt seen for the first time. Also, we're gonna give the man his flowers. It's been three decades that he's been doing it on Broadway, on film, in TV, and now writing a comic book. So uh, the man does it all and he does it with humor. And uh, I'm just really excited about what we're gonna get to do today. So uh, let's go. What's up, Nate? Nice to meet you. How, you How doing? you doing? What took you so long? I'm sorry, New York well, traffic. Yeah, New York traffic sucks. <laughs> we're going downstairs to my man cave where the craziness happens. It's yeah. a beautiful home you have. Oh, thank you, bro. You said to everybody you meet, though. <laughs> like I'm in a college professor's right, office, right, right. about to get in trouble. <laughs> now, Nick, we called you into the office because we've heard rumors about you. They're all true. Please share them. I'm ready to take down notes. I want to learn from you. So when you did that, and then what'd you do? I want to take it back before we even start the interview. Sure. Because you actually played a, a key role in my life. How's that? Uh, when I was a, a senior in high school in Berkeley, my girlfriend at the time was like, I want to go see this, this show that's coming to Sellerbach Hall. And uh, I was like, I can't afford Seller Brock Hall. Seller Brock Hall is expensive. She's like, no, oh, if we're the ushers, we'll get into the show for free. <laughs> she had a like, whole right. system, yeah. I was like, all right, let's go. And it was, it was freak. I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I remember sitting down and just from the start of your show, and this is me as a senior in high yeah. school, was the first time that I really felt seen. It was the first time wow. that I was like, wow, there's somebody here who's got one foot in hip hop, one foot in Latin <laughs> culture, who's going through all these different things with their parents, with, with immigration, because I'm a first generation immigrant. Yeah. It, it was really the first time where I saw myself on stage, on TV, on something, and, and really felt like, okay, I'm not going through this alone. Mm. And that was the first time that I was like, oh, maybe I could do something in media. Maybe I could do something to represent the, the journey that I'm going through and all the people that are going through the, the, the things that I'm going through. Well, that's incredible, because that's what I wanted to do in my work. I wanted to reach people who were like me, kids that were like me, that felt unseen, un, unwanted, that you didn't matter, you didn't count. And because because you have to fight that every day, that sense of I can't do this. It, this 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 place is not geared for me. So you know, I wanted to, I wanted to shake that up and go, yes, you can. Every one of us can. I always like to kind of start interviews by setting the tone, the way that the intro sequence in a movie was. So if we take it back to Jackson Heights, to your childhood home, that intro sequence like pans into your childhood home, what are we seeing, what are we <laughs> hearing, what are we smelling? Yeah, so you're, you're going through Jackson Heights and you're coming down into the planet and then you see a subway pass by and when the subway clears, you keep going through and there's our apartment on the fourth floor, 4A of, on Deadman Street. And uh, it was a cul-de-sac right next to the subway, so I would watch a lot of TV. And maybe this is why I learned partly how to write was because I'd be watching like Dan August or something. When they go, we just got the killer. And the train would come like, and you would see this. <laughs> and that's who the murderer was. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I used to have to try to piece it all together in my head. And then you would see my mom cooking. I mean, who knows, pig's feet, <laughs> garbanzos, you know, rice. What were the sounds that were emanating from the streets at that time? Yeah, the sounds were kids playing, yelling. Music music at the time was always salsa or, or some R&B. 
And and then you know up rock dancing was was huge at all all the community centers after school. And then when hip hop came, you know all my friends who were like incredible break dancers, which I couldn't. You know I'd go home and you know you practice in your room, and you might go, ¿Qué está haciendo? What are you doing in there? You breaking the walls? You know you're just throwing yourself around trying to grab a move, but all you're doing is just bashing against the walls. Talk a little bit about having that energy growing up. I, I read that you actually got into acting kind of by getting into trouble at school. Can, yeah, yeah. can you take us back to, to that time? You know, I, I was like a class cut up, kind of like a problematic child. I was a, the, the poster child for a troubled kid. The school made me go, go to therapy because they wouldn't let me back unless I, I had therapy, which I hated at the moment, but then now, you know, it saved my life. But one of my friends, Indio, suggested like, you know, what do we come and do the number seven train and you get on the mic? It was like an open mic. He made up his own open mic night on the subway. So we kicked the conductor's booth open and then I grabbed the mic and I started, you know, just do, <laughs> doing all my words. I get, get, I get, get, me balls. I get, 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 get. I said, boy, I said, boy, you're a chicken hawk, boy. Over the I, speaker for the whole. Yes. Wow. And I kept going and going and singing songs and whatever. How did you go from that to actual having acting classes? Well, my, my math teacher, Mrs. Zufa, would, would tell me, you know, instead of, you know, Mr. Lesquizamo, instead of wrecking the class, you know, they can make penis on moldy bread, they can make something out of you. Why don't you take your, whatever it is that you do and become a comedian? So it was like the first person that said, oh wow, I could maybe do something with this. And he was a mentor, you know, Mrs. Zufa was a mentor. You need, like when you come from the, from the neighborhoods that we come from, you need somebody outside of you to tell you that you can, that you're worthy. So I needed that several times. So yeah, I found an acting school, Sylvia Lee Showcase Theater, and I went there, and uh, this little old lady who looked, sounded like Catherine Hepburn, she was like, oh, it's so good to have you. Ah. And then I, you know, I said, yo, what's that lady, what are you doing? So she's like, oh, your accent is horrific. We're going to have to do something. You'll never work with that sound. What's up, lady, why, why not? And you know, so she gave me, she sold me like hundreds of dollars worth of like dialect classes. Mm -hmm. So she was making a buck off my back. But, you know, that's why it sounds so incredible today. So uh, you can't tell where I'm from. You thought I was from England, didn't you? Yeah, is it, why are you laughing like that? No, because I, 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 <laughs> I heard the same thing. Like, I originally wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And, uh, and people were like, you'll never be a sports broadcaster. You got a thick accent. Like, that's not, oh, and you, and you have a, you know, you slow down your speech. And sometimes, and they're like, you'll never be a sports broadcaster. How crazy is that? Because that's the sound that I want to hear. I'm like, where are the Latinx sportscasters? I want to hear those sounds. Yeah. I was talking to a couple of friends recently. We were doing a movie, and there were three Latin people in it, which was like a miracle because it's, I'm always the only one, or, and they're the only ones. This one actress had a much thicker accent because she's younger, so she's had less time to work on it. But I go, I love your sound. You know, I love Rosie Perez's sound. I love Dasha Polanco's sound. You know, I, I love those... Those, the, the way that the language moves and the diphthongs is stretched out and mm -hmm. a little bit of urban, a little Latino in it. It's such a beautiful sound. Yep. Once you started to act, did that feel like a way to just work through some of that energy? I think it's a combination of things. I mean, definitely in that acting class. The teacher was brilliant, actually, and she gave me Dino, this book. It's about a teenager who's having troubles at home with his, hates his father, and, and was arrested, and, and is in therapy, and it was like, oh wait, check, 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 check. So when I did it, it was like, like an epiphany. But that's when I realized, oh my God, I can do this. This is the only thing I wanna do. I don't wanna, I don't care if I'm famous or successful or rich, I just wanna do this thing. And then, I think there's a couple years before you get to NYU, what are, what are those years like? And is that when you're working at KFC? <laughs> KFC was paying for my acting classes because her uh, diction classes and diction tapes were mad expensive. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, I worked there for two years. I, at, the, at the Times Square KFC, I saw things that a young, no young man should ever see. Walk me through that period in your life. I mean, you're working at KFC, you're acting, you're going to school. Yeah. Like, what was that time like? We see now, we see all the awards, we see this yeah. amazing office you have, but it's like, I'm sure there's somebody watching who was probably in those shoes when you yeah. were at that time, figuring, how am I going to make it out of this job and to start my career? You know, I was failing in high school, but I was doing the acting classes. I was in therapy. And then, you know, uh, reality hit. I was like, oh my God, I got to apply for colleges. My grade point was terrible. And, como se dice en español, me puse las pilas. I got. I got sharp and I was like, I gotta, I gotta fix myself, I gotta fix my life. What inspired you to ponerte las pilas? Working at Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, I just saw I'm not 
I, I did it all. I was cook. I was cashier. I did the catering. I did it all. I go, this is going to be the rest of my life. I don't, I don't want that to be me. I want to have something. And then I couldn't get into NYU at first. I had to go, I had to, go to CW Post, which actually ended up being the most education I ever got in my entire life with those mm. two years I spent at CW Post. And then I transferred to NYU because that was the, the best acting program that I thought it existed in America. Here I am in NYU, a student. I had fixed my accent a lot by this point. And all the white kids in my class were going to five auditions a day. I was going to one every five months. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm working as hard as they are. I got better grades. And then I realized, oh my God, I don't have the same opportunities as they have. And I realized, I, you know, I realized that I, it, was, it, was, it wasn't an equal playing field. You know, it just was never gonna be. I mean, you know, it disillusioned you, you're a young man and you realize, oh my God, life is not fair because just because of how I look how I sound, my economic class that I come from. It's just not a fair playing field. No matter how talented you are, it doesn't matter. And, but I thought talent was, equalizer. Is, was the great equalizer. And so the audition that I would go to every five months was always for a drug dealer, a murderer, a killer, or, or somebody, your gardener, or somebody servicing your house. And, and it was like, wait a minute, I worked this hard to be playing those kind of roles? I started doing improv and other things because I was like, you know, this work, working towards Hollywood, which was really Hollywoodn't, was not going to be the place. So I started to find other ways, other avenues. And uh, I started finding theater, off-Broadway theater and, and performance art. And performance art was the place that I found my freedom. Was that your way of just showing Hollywood your own worth through your own eyes, not through their eyes? Yes, yes. Writing became my way to for me as an artist to be my full self. How I saw myself, not how Hollywood or network TV saw me. Because look, right now, the census came out, the 2020 census, and, and it said we're 20, almost 20% of the population. And then a couple years ago, we were only 3% of the faces in front of the camera. Less than 1% of the stories, less than 1% of the crew, less than 1% of the executives. That's cultural apartheid. And the same thing goes for politics, you know, less than 1% of elected officials. And forget about publication, Latin children are the least seen in children's picture books. So right then there, your self-esteem as a child is already being challenged. Think about that. Marinate on that. It's... I'll be right back with you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in my podcast with Nick and John. People who might not be of the culture might not fully understand the full impact of that, right? Because that not only affects our self-esteem, it also affects how people who don't interact with us on a daily basis see us. see us. Then they don't necessarily think about our positive contributions to this country. Right, so not only are we invisible, but when we are seen, it's a negative portrayal. You said in an interview, it was in 94, it was on PBS, and you said that most of the roles that you were up for were stereotypical, and yeah. were one-dimensional. And, yeah. and you were just asking to have three-dimensional characters yeah. who could actually lead a movie and not just be supporting. Right, how do, you create, how do you create a Latin star in America when the roles are one-dimensional and, and not worthy of awards? The, the ugly question is, why aren't Latin people succeeding? What's the ugly question? Are we not smart enough, not talented enough, not good-looking enough, not hard-working enough? No, none of those stereotypes and racist ideas because nobody tries harder with less access. A friend of mine, I won't say her name, said, uh, years ago when, when I was doing Mobile Miles, sent out her resume, dark-skinned Latin woman, sent out her, her resume with a picture, one with a Latin name, her real name, and then one with a white, whiteified name. The whiteified got callbacks. Wow. The Latin one got nothing. That's, that's just, just off a name. Just off a name, exactly. And that's just explains the whole situation right then and there. You made that statement in 94. We're, mm. you know, almost 30 years later. Do you feel like things have changed? Yes, yes, things have changed incrementally, unfortunately. 40 years I've been in this business, and I guess we went from 1% to maybe this year, I think we're gonna be at four or 5% in front of the camera. I'm not sure what, what the numbers are behind. I mean, things are improving, I think. I think COVID made us really look at ourselves in America. I think Black Lives Matter was huge awakening for America, a reboot for America to look at themselves and see what's going on. 
I think everybody's trying to do the right thing and hire many more people of color. I mean, what I want to see, I want to see 20% of the, of the roles in front of the camera, of the crew, of the stories, of the executives. We are 25% of the U.S. box office. Yeah, one in four. And, and, and we have 3% of the faces. I'm not asking for extra. I just want what, what's due us. I mean, I, I've seen the development process through all my life at, at every studio, New Line, Universal, Fox Searchlight. They work on scripts for years and years, polishing them, making it better. And half of those die, and then half of them make it to the screen. We need to be in that pipeline. They need to be taking Latin scripts and working them that hard so by the time they get to this point, they're the best that can be. Yep. But it, it, it just takes somebody who looks like me being an executive and saying that story is worthy. Because I've been pitching stories for 30 years, always thinking that my writing was sh falling short because it never got greenlit. So I was like, oh, damn, I thought it was a good script. But then I'm winning awards on Broadway and off-Broadway, Obie Awards and Drama Desk Awards for my writing and, and, and a Tony, Tony nominations and even Emmys. But never getting my movies done. And, you know, there was the always excuses were, you know, white Latin people don't want to see Latin people. I'm like, no, then who do I want to see for Christmas at my house? Some Norwegian family said, no, I, I want to see Latin people is what, what I want to see. And, or they would tell me like when Critical Thinking, I, I, I directed, they would tell me Latin people don't want to see feel good movies. No, no, we want to see really depressing suicidal flicks. That's that's an actual conversation. The actual, actual that's things. That's insane that that would come out right. of someone. Was it, it's, it's Hollywood wisdom, you know. There, there is an audience and a hunger, so I know that exists regardless of what a, a studio head or a network says to me anymore. I know Hamilton would have never got made at a studio or a network. They would have been, oh, I'm sorry, Lynn, I'm sorry, but uh, wait a minute, Burr's gonna be black and, and, and Hamilton's gonna be Puerto Rican, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to laugh, but uh, I, I can assure you they didn't speak in hip hop back in the 1700s, the founding fathers. It would have never got made, never. But why did, but theater, there are no gatekeepers. You just got to raise that money and get a good review, and 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 now you got the biggest masterpiece that Broadway has ever seen. I have a bunch more questions, but how do you want to space it between here and the restaurant? Oh, he's hungry. That's his segue. That's his subtle way of saying I'm hungry. <laughs> Because your stomach was grumbling when it take you to lunch. Yeah, is this your, uh, one of your favorite spots? One of my or? favorite spots, the margarita's a killer. Down here, I mean, I used to go see a lot of theater and perform, that's what you were asking me about, where did I perform? It was, yep. I did my performance art at PS 122, a converted school, Gusto House, Dixon Place, The Kitchen, Knitting Factory, all these little spots, like you had like 20 people maybe mm. <laughs> in, the, in the audience. Do you remember that first time that you hit the stage, what that feeling was like? Oh my God, it was incredible. I was doing uh, a one-man piece. It was a, a one-man show about if Latin people had written the Bible, and, you know, as Jesus and Mary and all Latino, you know, loud and boisterous and fun. And, uh, and the crowd loved it, and it was amazing. It was, like, it was my first full-length piece that I wrote and performed by myself playing all the characters. Are you nervous? Or oh, you like hell yeah. If you're not nervous, then you're not, then it's not really, you're not really risking anything. Here we are, this is my spot right here. Oh, nice. You have your Vax card? Yep. Hey, how you doing? How's it going? How are you? What's that? How about a little mezcal? Uh, Damn, what do you drink? A little Oaxaca Express. Yeah. yeah. Yeah! Well, here it comes, his lunch. <laughs> to Walk Express. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. A, a meal replacement, here you go. Cheers. Cheers, brother, cheers. cheers. To you. To you, to, to all the doors you've opened. And a glass ceiling that keeps, I got scars in my head from hitting that glass ceiling. Luckily, I'm hard-headed, so it, I don't really feel it. I feel like we have to be in this, in this industry just to be able to make it past all the, the no's. Yes. Talk about that a little bit, because I feel like you hear so many no's that, like, it's hard. I don't care how hard your, your, your skin is. Yeah. At some point, you start to internalize that. Like, how do you maneuver through the industry and, and all the no's? Well, it's interesting because, you know, the rule is you, you become a celebrity, you get a certain amount of success, you don't talk about your problems. You don't talk about the difficulties. You act like, oh, it was a, it was a magic carpet ride, you right. know? 
I feel like it's really important to talk about all the problems and all the difficulties, especially if you're a, a person of color, and especially if you're Latinx. There's a lot of the people struggling and, and we need to change things. And Spike Lee showed me, because he's one of the first who spoke out against hashtag Hollywood so white. Well, he was hashtag Oscar so white, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you're, yeah. oh, okay, so let's be real. So he, he brought that out and I was like, yeah, I went right and started retweeting him like crazy. And then I posted hashtag Oscar so white, but hashtag Hollywood's even whiter. Mm. You know, there's colorism within Latin culture that we have to fix, but there's colorism in Hollywood too. I mean, I benefited from being light skinned and, and I stayed out of the sun so I could work. Wow. I, I definitely would not go in the sun for years. I was so pasty. That was a conscious thing. Oh yeah, because oh, that wow. could work. And uh, and all the Latinos that made it so far, a lot of them were all light skinned. You know, what happened to all the Afro Latino and, and and the majority of indigenous Latinos? Mm -hmm. They they don't get a shot. You know, so you know, there's a lot of things we got to deal with in Hollywood, and we got to fix, and we got to speak out, and we got to speak up, and and you're doing it. I mean, this 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 is such an important space to have, you know, to be able to talk about all these things. You have been not shy about vocalizing these things. Why is it important to you and why do you think not as many people are as vocal as you are about this subject? Well, being vocal has its, its cause. It has a cause. Like when I became very politically conscious and then politically on my social, I lost half my followers. Wow. And then I got a lot of hate. <laughs> tweets, you know, go back to your country, go back to Mexico, which I'm, I'm not Mexican, but I'll gladly go back to Mexico because it's a great country. Still, like when I post political stuff on, on Facebook, they go, John, you used to be so entertaining, now you're a bore, but you know, all this hate stuff, yep. which I ignore, you know. I feel like if you've achieved a certain amount of success, it's your duty to give back. You gotta give back. You can't be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand and pretend it's not happening, not existing. I don't know, I'm just too socially conscious and, and I feel like I had a fight to get here and I've earned the scars and the wounds and I wanna talk about how I had to fight to get here. If, if anybody had done what I had done, they'd be so much, for, I mean, I got produ a producer tell me, I'm not gonna name his name, but he said, you know, too bad, John, you're Puerto Rican because you're so talented, otherwise you'd be so much further along. And that wasn't an insult, it was an actual fact. Hmm. At the time, I didn't know how to take it, but now I know, it's like, yeah, because you are Latin, you're only gonna get so far. You're only gonna get certain roles. You're only gonna get certain opportunities. I was in a movie for a week, and then I get a call from the director going, oh, John, I'm sorry, I can't have you in the movie anymore. I go, why, what happened? Lose the funding? No, no, uh, we cast this Latin actress, and we can't have two Latin people in the movie because it becomes a Latin movie. You know what I mean, right? And I'm like, you mean, and I'm like, I wanted to say like, what do you mean, it's better? No, no, he meant like, I can only have one token at a time. And this is recent? No, this was about eight years ago. Okay. I mean, tokenism is real, glass ceilings are real, colorblind casting was promised to me by all the artists in the 70s. We were gonna break that down and then it wasn't, it wasn't until Hamilton, 2000 somewhat, that they finally did it and it succeeded. It showed that it does work. Take me to you going back to theater for Latin history for morons. I wanna talk about what I imagine was probably a very personal uh, mm. conversation between you and your son. Right. Can you take me to that day when he comes home from school and he tells you that he's being bullied? Like, what was that conversation like? Well, that's kinda of hard, especially after having some uh, mezcal. I don't know, I don't wanna want get mad emotional on camera. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't wanna, I wanna, I wanna keep this, uh, it was a hard, hard conversation. Obviously, you, 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 you know, it's, it's your beloved child, and they're being mistreated and and uh, profiled racially and ostracized, and the school didn't know how to handle it, and it was terrible. Um, but I wanted, I, I wanted to be an evolved father. I didn't want to be like my my dad. Would we go, you know, go kick his? Don't come back home till you kick his ass. The door's locked till you kick his ass. I mean, I wanted to do that, but I didn't. But I also wanted to be an evolved dad, and I wanted. To, to weaponize his information and give him Latin information about our history to strengthen him, to arm him. I looked through his history textbook and it's like, wait a minute, there's nothing mentioning our contributions or anything. It's like we didn't exist. So I started doing mad research and learning so much. And the crazy thing was, I was the one that was healing. I was the one that was being empowered. And then I realized, oh my God, I can do this for the 70 million Latinos in America. 
I can do this maybe for the 500 million speakers in the world, you know, through this work. Let me take it back just, just a little bit. To, you go wherever you want to go. To, to, Nick, to, this is your to, show. To the, to the conversation. I, I'm not trying to I don't hog get too, up the airwaves, bro. <laughs> I know you don't want to get too emotional. I just want to talk a little bit more on the personal side because it's like everyone could turn on Netflix and see the result of it. Right. But the fact that it came from such personal caring from one generation to the next generation of like, I don't want you to go through what I went through. No, I, mean, I don't want any kid to go through what I went through. I don't want any Latin kid to go through through what I went through. I don't want any white kid, black kid, Asian kid. And for it to be so close to home, it was, it was devastating, you know? So I was definitely, couldn't believe that my son is having to go through the same shit, you know, 40 years later, or, you know, that, that I went through is crazy. So you, that conversation happens. At what point did, does it instantly hit you? Oh my God, he will not let it go. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh my God, he will not let it go. I've you probably, can tell he's Latin. Because Latin people are tenacious as f <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Sí, entiendo, pero no, vamos a hablar de lo que yo, yo quiero hablar. We're going to talk about what I want to talk about. You can skirt the issue you want, but no. I'm still getting back. No, no. That's the reporter and his mom. Let's, let's talk about your mom. <laughs> I want to talk about your mom because your mom's incredible. So, she was a big influence on you. Uh, a huge no, influence. No, no, don't try to skirt the issue. No, no, I'm, I'm going to bring it back around. I'm going to okay. tie it up with a nice knot. <laughs> you brought up my mom. My mom's a professor. In a good way, in a bad out of respect. In, in an amazing way. My mom's a professor at Berkeley. She comes in and stays with me. It probably was for Thanksgiving or Christmas. I show her Latin history for morons. She's like, this is amazing. <laughs> the next semester, she incorporates it into the class. Oh, no, get out of this. Class. amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. But your mom was a huge influence for you. and, 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 and My mom's my hero. Like, yeah. I, I didn't turn it's on incredible. the TV. To, to There wasn't anything on TV for me. Like you said, there wasn't really much for me to turn on and be like, oh, this is something. Like, my mom was my mom, my dad, my best friend. Right, the, right, the person. right. Like, she wore incredible. all the hats. She'd yeah, yeah. Like, the single Latin single mom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my mom was a single mom too. I mean, I had a dad till, I mean, I still have a dad, but he was at home till we were 13. And then my mom became a, you know, a super mom, mm -hmm. single mom, Latin mom, dad. So you know. Yeah, but we're the same flavor, you know, like sort of urban street intellectuals. We're educated, we made it through college because of our single moms and whatnot, and it's a certain badge of honor. I wear that proudly. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Here's, here's to you. Here's to you. Again, once again. <laughs> What's left for you to accomplish? Oh, so much. I'd love to help the next generation get their, their work done, made, produced. There's so much great talent out there. I want to be able to help them. I want to be that studio exec that, that gets their, that gets their uh, material and their product greenlit. The, the exec we've been needing for, for yeah. a long time. I love it. To you. No, no, you no, don't mean it. No, to you, bro. No, to you. No, you, no, to no, you this again. Time no, no, you, you know, you know you're a narcissist. No, no. Come on. It's all about him. No, Come on. This one's yeah, yeah. to you. No, and, no, you don't have to. Don't even try. Esto para la cultura. Let's go. Para la cultura, bro. Much love, much love. Much respect. Likewise. So we're on the way back to the hotel. As you can tell, we're in a New York City street. We got jackhammers, taxi cabs, people walking by, probably wondering why I'm holding a camera. But, uh, but yeah, taking a little time to reflect on the conversation today. I think the, the high school senior in me is still freaking out that, uh, that I got to meet somebody who, who inspired me greatly. I am thankful for John for opening up his home and just being thoughtful and sharing a very vulnerable side to him. I think it's important, you know, we hear numbers thrown around, 70 million Latinos, 4% of movie roles, but I think when you see the humanity behind it, you know, when you see how it affects a son, when you see how it affects a father, uh, I think that's when it's like, okay, now, now I understand what this conversation's about. And I'm thankful for, for John for doing that. And it's cold, and I'm looking forward to the next episode. So uh, thank you for tuning in, and we will see you at the next one.